Hello, welcome to the series about Camille Flammarion. Today we have a final part, part four of the episode one, which is about the biography of Camille Flammarion. And again, we have the pleasure to call Charles to join us here in the studio. Hello, Charles. Hello, Munir. Hello, everyone. Very thank you for having me, for having me, and happy to be here again with all of you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Charles. So, if you remember, we started on the first Sunday of January with part one of episode one, which is about Camille from our own um, for a biography. Charles found this amazing book about his autobiography. So it was packed with information. And also he went even further than that, collecting information. And then we decided to split in four parts. So we had parts one, two, and three. And today we have the final one where Charles is going to um, you know, present us the final years of Camille from Arion. And um, we have already started uh, the first Sunday of this month Two weeks ago, we had Alexandre Caldini with us already talking about one of uh, Camille Framarion's work. And then from now on, the first Sunday of each month, we we'll have a guest here talking to us about one of, uh, of Framarion's work. So again, welcome you. Charles, it's a pleasure to have you here. I hand it over to you. It's all yours. Thank you so much, Munir. Thank you all for, for having me again. <coughs> Sorry for that. Uh, for this fourth part of Camille Flammarion, so uh, the third part uh, we finished uh, at the, almost at the 20th century uh, because uh, the history of Camille Flammarion is uh, really extremely rich, uh, a lot of information. And the more I work on, on him, the more I find other information which are also extremely interesting. Okay, so um, last time, as I told, we finished uh, around uh, 1898, uh, uh, the, the change of the century. Uh, and uh, by looking the paper I had, I found uh, this letter, as you can see here. It's uh, dated 10th of October, 1898. It's a letter he sent to Pierre Gaetan Lemarie, uh, who was the editor of the Spiritist magazine. And... Uh, Camille Flammarion informed about the most recent edition of the, the book, the romance he wrote, uh, uh, which is called Human, Lumen. And it's a new edition with a very nice illustration from this Lucien Rudeau. Uh, happily, I have uh, one uh, issue here with me, so you can see, sorry for the flux, uh, uh, one of the illustrations. And uh, in the book, there are uh, several uh, other illustrations, uh, which makes it uh, a very, very nice book. Um, I, I did not read it yet, but uh, it's one book uh, I really am really committed to read. Uh, um, and you see this letter is a paper from Observatoire de Juvisy. And, and here you see at night uh, with the moon. A picture of the Observatoire de Juvisy that uh, I showed uh, in the in the part third part uh, of the presentation, which was an old post office which has been uh, donated to Camille Flammarion, who transformed it into an observatory, and he also took this opportunity to go and live in Juvisy sur Orge, which is a city about 30 kilometers away from Paris, or maybe a little bit more, more in the campaign, uh, and that was. Uh, a little, coming a little bit closer to his origin uh, with a, a big garden around uh, uh, where he made also these experiments uh, about uh, growing influence of different type of light uh, of growing of plants okay uh, here you have the list i think i showed it is from 1900 you have the list of the books he wrote so you see uh, from the one i showed uh, earlier uh, this is uh, more complete huh? and uh, classified by philosophical books, astronomical, prat practical astronomical books, astronomic teachings books, general sciences, and uh, vari varieties, uh, literary via var varieties, okay? And uh, it is in 1898, uh, I, I also uh, showed you last time that he 
a little bit before he entered in contact uh, with uh, Charles Richet, Dr. Dariex, uh, from this uh, Society for Psychical Research uh, here in France. And in 1898, he even organized in his home a number of sessions with the Italian medium, uh, which was uh, Zapia Paladino, who, who came to, to France. Uh, the experimenter uh, paid really a lot of money for her. So you can see here some pictures taken at the home of Flammarion. And uh, Flammarion caught her in the act of cheating. Uh, uh, and it's uh, distrusting uh, Zapia at that time. Uh. She was not always cheating. Some of the phenomena are authentic. But since uh, the money offered to her for uh, producing the phenomenon was so high, unfortunately, uh, the, it was a big temptation uh, to make them work even when they don't work. Huh? Uh, and uh, this uh, did not pass uh, through the, uh, the, the vigilance of uh, Camille Flammarion allowed to detect it. Huh? And uh, it's a bit dis distrust huh, who, ch who, who came from him, to him from previous experiences carried out with other mediums from whom he had detected fraud. Huh? Uh, and he's saying, I have seen with my own eyes seen the photo prepared by Buguet. I showed you the, the picture already also uh, uh, in the part three. Huh? Seen with my eyes since, Slade writing below the table on a hidden slate. Huh? So uh, he has really caught uh, several mediums, uh, um, how to say, uh, in fraud. Uh, and since he was uh, making a lot of researches, uh, participating in this uh, uh, psychical researches. Uh, he, he wrote this book, huh, The Unknown and the Psychical, uh, psychical Problems, uh, in 1900. And uh, since he also received uh, a lot of letters with uh, facts and phenomena uh, that the people uh, sent to him, huh, because he was known for doing these researches, and also known as an astronomer, he had a lot of material. Huh, uh, that, uh, how to say, first-hand material uh, and elements of facts that he, he was gathering in these books. Here you see the index of this book, huh? demonstrations of the dying, apparition, telepathy, psychic communication, mental suggestions, remote view, the world of dreams, divination and the futures. And in this book, he's presenting 76 cases. Huh? Uh, it was uh, one volume at, at uh, 1900. But uh, later on, uh, you see the 26th edition, it was already completed, uh, two volumes, part one and part two, uh, with uh, more cases uh, in it. Uh, but I, I don't go further because I think that is one of the books that will be presented by another presenter in this uh, Camille Flammarion series. So again, uh, you see scientific approach about the psychic phenomenon. Uh, he knew perfectly uh, the spirit is body of knowledge. Uh, but his focus was more uh, on the scientific uh, aspect rather than uh, pushing all the philosophical and ethical consequences, uh, as we have seen also in the discourse he made at the uh, funeral of Alan Kardec, uh, uh, nevertheless admitting that uh, the spiritist body of knowledge was still uh, the best explanation uh, for all these uh, phenomena he gathered in the book. 1901, so continuing uh, publishing uh, about uh, astronomy uh, uh, and science in general. You see, this is a book, uh, Curiosity of Science, not only on astronomy, but also on a wider scope. 1902, uh, another example, uh, he made a scientific note on uh, the Pantheon Pendulum, uh, you know, this uh, an experiment taken up in 1902 on behalf of the Astronomical Society of France uh, by Mr. Camille Flammarion. And this pendulum uh, is uh, done by uh, to, to put in evidence the Coriolis inertia forces, uh, which are linked to the rotation of the Earth. Uh. So it's part uh, of uh, astronomy, and he made a notice about this that you can also find and download uh, from the Na French National Library. Another particularity of Camille Flammarion, 1903, ladies' astronomy. So he was 
popularizing uh, the astronomy, but also uh, with a particular focus to ladies. Huh? The, uh, probably he was helped for this uh, with, for, from his uh, spouse, huh? which was Sylvie, uh, which also wrote some books, uh, as we will see later. And she was uh, collaborating a lot to his works. 1905, uh, the atmosphere and the great phenomena of nature. Uh, so as, as we know uh, already, um, meteorology has also been one of his domain of interest on top of uh, the uh, astronomy, uh, because uh, looking uh, to the other planets, uh, of course, uh, he was also trying to find out uh, about what's happening on those planets. Huh? Uh, even so, uh, the, 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 the means of investigation were very limited at that time. And for instance, a lot of discovery he has made of, on the planet March have been later found uh, as uh, not being authentic huh? with uh, more powerful telescopes. Uh, it has been determined that uh, roughly Mars has no uh, atmosphere or almost no atmosphere. Uh, 1905, you see again about meteorology, uh, the whims of lightning, huh? uh, and there are, uh, so which was considered as, a, 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 how to say, a, a miracle or a God's anger or whatsoever during a long time, and which was uh, at that time perfectly uh, known from a scientific point of view. He, he also wrote a book about uh, this subject. And you see always the books, huh? uh, the editor was Ernest Flammarion, so this means his brother. Um, <clears throat> this is a book uh, written by his spouse, huh? Sylvie Flammarion. So she, she was uh, six years older than him, huh? born 1836, and she died in 1919. Huh? We will come back to this. And uh, she wrote a book huh? uh, uh, with the title Peace Through Woman. So, I don't have the book, and uh, it's also not yet available on the French National Library. But let's see if we can uh, ask them to uh, to make to scan it, uh, to put them somewhere uh, in a list of books to be scanned, because it's also very interesting to see what uh, his pose uh, uh, wrote as a book. So again, uh, she was feminist and also uh, deeply pacifist. Camille Flammarion was as well. A pacifist, huh, as we have seen uh, uh, in several occasions already earlier. Um, and so probably it was a book uh, done uh, in uh, narrow collaboration between them. And uh, 1907 uh, came the new edition of the Natural Unknown, uh, Unknown Natural Forces huh, um, that you can see here. It's also a book that will be subject to a detailed presentation by another presenter uh, this year. Uh, as you remember, uh, the first edition, I talked about it already, was 1866 by uh, Didier. Huh? And uh, it was uh, 152 pages and signed with a pseudonym Hermès, huh? because uh, at that time it was uh, to answer to the polemics uh, after the Davenport Brothers shows in Paris. And he's also uh, reporting the experiences that happened uh, in, in the... Uh, with the emperor and the empress. Huh? So uh, that is probably one of the main reasons why he, he signed it uh, with uh, uh, a pseudonym. Nevertheless, the content uh, has been then uh, a lot uh, extended uh, for this new edition, huh? uh, which has been increased. Huh? 1908, again, uh, he wrote uh, this time with Librairie Hachette, you remember, this is the... the a publishing company which was specialized for uh, a very high volume of books, uh, very simple huh, to put in pocket for a very large uh, public of readers. Uh, and here you see astronomical initiation. So it was really, again, a subject, uh, uh, astronomy for the beginners or uh, how to teach astronomy to my grandmother or something like that, huh, this style. Uh, very simple, uh, very accessible uh, and uh, uh, that he made uh, in this collection of scientific uh, initiations uh, for the library Hachette. This was 1908. 1911, 
uh, Camille Flammarion got uh, a scientific jubilee, huh? so he has been recognized uh, some prizes uh, from France. Also, uh, next the year after, he was officer in the Legion of Honor, huh? Legion d'Honneur in French, for his works to popularize uh, astronomy. Previously, he was Knight of the Legion of Honor huh? on January 1881, so you can see something like 20 years before. And later, he had the uh, highest grade, which was commander of the Legion of Honor, and that was granted to him 12th of August, uh, 1922. Okay. Continuing, uh, this is the famous book that uh, Munir uh, mentioned at the beginning. Huh? This is his, his own autobiography. Uh, it has been published in uh, 1912. Huh? Um, it, it covers uh, his biography from uh, his birth until uh, uh, 1870. Uh, unfortunately, well, he, he, he announced that he would uh, make a compliment, but uh, he never did it. Huh? So all this part after 1870, we have much less details uh, about his information. Huh? Uh, and, and this book uh, about the, the beginning of his uh, biography, uh, is uh, still here available uh, and uh, full of uh, very interesting information that, that I mostly presented in the two, first two parts of uh, these uh, presentations. 1930, for the bicentenary of Diderot, huh, he wrote also a book uh, dedicated to, to Diderot. Huh, um, it was uh, in, in, a, in a review, but it's also in a magazine, but it's also uh, been uh, in the French National Library. And uh, uh, voilà, so it, he, it's also part of uh, uh, what he liked a lot, huh? the history of science. I'm not showing here also all the articles he published in this uh, um, Annal des Sciences Psychiques, huh? these psychical magazines. But which are also uh, a lot. This is a complement I still have to do once uh, to, 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 to show you also how much uh, articles, what, what was his production in these psychical researches. Uh, 1914, uh, it was uh, World War I, huh? so it was a very di difficult uh, period in France. Camille Flammarion took a refuge in Arcachon, so more south of France. And then in Cherbourg, huh, which, by the way, was not so protected, but uh, nevertheless uh, out of Paris uh, during a certain time. So he and his pose that you can see here in the pictures were pacifists, huh, and they really did not want uh, to be uh, at the center of the conflict, huh, uh, to, to participate to it. Um, after the First World War, then uh, this is really the period where he devoted himself much more to the spiritualist questions than to sciences. Uh, uh, he continued also the scientific uh, magazines he was publishing, but his focus changed. Uh, his focus was more oriented to uh, the psychical researches uh, that he started uh, in, uh, at the end of the 19th century. Okay. And uh, his spouse died uh, 23rd of February 1919, uh, Sylvie Flammarion, born 1836, and, and uh, she died 1919, uh, from Spanish flu, Spanish flu, sorry. So she died, as you can see, with uh, 82 years old. And uh, it was in Juvisy, uh, where there was this observatory and where they were living. These pictures probably have been, been taken in the garden of... Uh, his property in Juvisy. And also searching in my paper, I discovered uh, this letter, which is dated 27th of February 1919. So this is uh, where I have to check whether uh, here it's written for 23rd and here 27th in the letter, he's, uh, he's writing, uh, my, just, my spouse just died. Huh? So he informed uh, Paul Lemarie, huh, which was the son and successor of Pierre Gaetan Lemarie. Uh, donc, uh, about the, the death uh, of his uh, loved uh, uh, spouse and giving uh, indication about the funeral, which, was, which would be the Saturday at uh, 3 o'clock p.m. Huh? Uh, 
uh, and she has been buried uh, in a tomb, which is also in the garden in Juvisy. Huh? Voilà. Uh, again, uh, looking for the old papers, I found this picture uh, where you see it's, uh, there is his signature, uh, Camille Flammarion, uh, and this picture was in October 1990, uh, 1919, sorry. Uh, and in September, so the same year where uh, Sylvie died, he ended up marrying uh, with his assistant, which was Gabriel Renaudot. Uh, She was also bachelor, had also a bachelor degree uh, and was author of numerous uh, scientific communication. And he knew her since a long time, uh, since 1893. But she was much younger. Huh? She was, uh, she died only in 1962. And she has worked uh, uh, until 1962 for the dissemination of uh, Camille Flammarion's work, maintaining the observatory in Juvisy as much as, as, as she could publishing also the annuary uh, of uh, astronomical uh, events, huh, uh, as I have presented already. So uh, she, she gave, uh, she, she made also, gave a big continuation to his works. And here you see 1919, so he was also already 77 years old. Huh? Uh, I found this picture and another one. Uh, this picture is from October 1919. And this one is, uh, there is nothing written, but it's also October 1919, because we see exactly the same uh, shape, uh, the, the paper in the same order on his desk and so on. So uh, obviously it's a picture taken the same day. I did not identify yet uh, who is the uh, person aside him, but uh, here you can see uh, Camille Flammarion in his work office, uh, in uh, his house in in his house in Juvisy. Okay. Uh, 1919, uh, it was also the year of the foundation of the uh, International Metapsychical Institute in Paris huh, by Jean Meyer. Uh, this uh, Institut Metapsychique International still ex is existing today huh, uh, uh, in Paris, uh, Rue de la Queduc. And they, uh, so the foundation was 1919, so it commemorated uh, 100 years uh, recently of existence. And amongst uh, the uh, directors uh, or the, the, the leaders of uh, this institute, uh, you can see, uh, amongst other Gabriel Delan, uh, we talked about him last year, Camille Flammarion, uh, Le Comte de Gramont, uh, the professor Charles Richet, Uh, Professor Santo Liquido, etc. Huh? Uh, all people which are very well known. And this uh, institute has been declared uh, uh, as d'utilité uh, publique in French, so means recognized uh, uh, as useful by the government. So uh, this gives the right to receive donations or legs, huh? um, which was uh, necessary huh, in order to finance uh, all the researches that was being done. Uh, in the institute, and Camille Flammarion was one of the directors. And <clears throat> this is then, uh, as 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 we as I wrote, huh, Camille Flammarion dedicated the end of his life more specifically uh, to uh, the psychical researches. And this is also where he wrote uh, this uh, last series of books. Huh? He received uh, thousands uh, of letters. Uh, Uh, about facts uh, that uh, the people uh, from France or even from other countries sent to him. So uh, he started uh, a big work classifying them and listing them in some volumes. So here you can see 1920 was the publication of Death and His Mis Its Mystery, volume first uh, before Death. So this is exactly the volume that has been commented by Alexander Caldini Uh, three weeks ago, uh, uh, here on this same channel. Uh, thanks a lot for Caldini for this work. Uh, uh, and there are a lot of uh, interesting statements of Camille Flammarion, as uh, Caldini showed, uh, about God, about uh, the existence of the soul, and so on. Uh, you know that these are really two fundamental beliefs he had, uh, uh, belief in God and belief in the existence of the soul and its survival after death. Huh? Even so, 
uh, as I also explained, Camille Flammarion was not 100% spiritist, huh, as uh, uh, Caldini also mentioned. So this book was really full of uh, uh, showing, listing all the phenomena, huh, uh, but does not uh, speak, talk a lot about uh, spiritism huh, or even reincarnation, huh, as, Cal as Caldini mentioned. Nevertheless, it's a very precious material because the spiritists need facts, huh? and the more facts we, uh, we have, the more facts that can be explained thanks to the spiritist body of knowledge, which are somehow confirming the spiritist body of knowledge, is uh, very precious uh, for the spiritist uh, teachings and the spiritist movement. Okay, And this is really the biggest contribution that Camille Flammarion brought uh, to uh, spiritism even without declaring himself 100% spiritist, okay? So that is the first volume. The second volume is here, the, next, the, the year after, huh? 1921. Uh, volume two is at the moment of death. So the first one is uh, all the phenomena that happened before the death. Huh? Uh, this one is uh, exactly when the people are... Uh, at the moment of death, so dying, uh, with some parallel uh, with the near-death experience, which was not so developed at that time because uh, reanimation techniques of medicine were not so developed as today. So there were some cases, but uh, much less than today. Uh. Uh, and uh, of course, it's very interesting to compare the facts he gathered uh, about these moments with others, uh, like uh, Ernesto Bozzano also wrote a book on the same subject uh, some, some uh, years later and uh, the facts uh, that are uh, coming now uh, from the, um, the near-death experience uh, uh, experiencer uh, statements, uh, which are uh, extremely numerous nowadays. And the third volume is here, uh, after death. So uh, proof of evidence coming after the death of a person, showing then the survival. So you see three volumes. Huh, and, uh, quite sick, huh? you can see here, uh, uh, volumes uh, that he compiled uh, on, on gathering uh, and uh, publishing uh, all the facts that he was able to gather uh, along all these years. There is also uh, another uh, event which happened at that moment. Huh? He was... Um, um, designated uh, president of the Society for Psychical Research in London. Huh? And uh, he has then, at that opportunity in 1923, made a speech. Huh? And this speech has been published by uh, Jean Meyer, huh? the Edition Jean Meyer. Huh? This is the book that you can see here, where uh, uh, giving in French huh? uh, his uh, speech uh, or, uh, at that uh, opportunity. So he was the third pre French president of the Society for Psychical Research at that time. The first one uh, was uh, um, Charles Richet, if I'm not uh, mistaken. The second one was uh, Bergson, uh, the famous French philosopher. And the third one was in 1923, uh, Camille Flammarion. Okay. And uh, in this book, uh, Jean Meyer published also uh, the uh, mediumistic essay huh, uh, called General Uranography. So he probably made it uh, in accordance with Camille Flammarion himself. Huh? You know that Camille Flammarion expressed some doubts about the mediumistic uh, origin huh, of these communications. And uh, Jean Meyer uh, got the agreement of Camille Flammarion to republish them in 1923. So this shows clearly that uh, when uh, Camille Flammarion got older after the Second World War, that is really where he, be, he, he, he went uh, much, much closer uh, to the spiritist uh, movement and the spiritist body of knowledge. Uh, voilà. Uh, uh, it's uh, the, the best books uh, of Camille Flammarion uh, concerning the spiritist movement are uh, this series that I'm just showing that he wrote uh, already in the 1920s. And uh, another one, which is a complement uh, to the death and his mysteries, 
is the haunted houses, huh? uh, which is also uh, very well known. And uh, he uh, gathered uh, in this uh, last one uh, also all the facts he uh, he published uh, all the facts here that he managed to gather on this uh, specific uh, uh, question. All these books, again, uh, published by uh, his brother, Ernest Flammarion. And they are quite easy to find because there were a lot of uh, in, the, in the old book uh, stores, uh, because there had been a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, prints and reprints, a lot of editions. Uh, so uh, luckily, they are quite easy to find. And uh, we have also uh, digitalized them and put them available into the uh, Spiritist Encyclopedia, uh, I remember, Encyclopedia Spirit, www.spiritism in French, uh, with the E behind, dot net, N-E-T. And there you can download uh, all these books uh, in French uh, for free. Uh, that is not the last book he wrote, because he wrote another one, uh, which is this one, uh, again, uh, published by Librairie des Sciences Psychiques, uh, by uh, Jean Meyer, who was a very close friend of Camille Flammarion. Um, it's a book about the death. What is the death, uh, uh, according to Camille Flammarion? And this book is also uh, containing uh, uh, foreword and also a letter uh, from Jean Meyer to Camille Flammarion, uh, showing then the narrow contact uh, they have. Uh, remembering Jean Meyer was, uh, how to say, a Swiss guy who installed and made uh, won, won a lot of money in France and dedicated a lot of money. He was founding uh, the Metapsychical uh, Institute uh, uh, in Paris, uh, building them uh, 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 a house uh, that... Uh, uh, they had uh, used to make uh, their uh, uh, headquarters and experiments. And uh, he also uh, offered to the spiritists the famous Maison des Spirites, uh, uh, which was a permanent uh, also uh, headquarter in Paris. Unfortunately, the Maison des Spirites uh, has been sold uh, when uh, Hubert Forestier died in 1972. And, but the Metapsychical Institute uh, is no more in that same house, but uh, they still have uh, also own premises uh, in, in Paris, uh, Rue de la Queduc, uh, nearby uh, Gare de l'Est and Gare du Nord in Paris. Uh, that's it. Uh, here I have uh, a same uh, gathered uh, also the list of books he has written, so you see. It's a little bit more extended uh, compared with the one I showed you, which was from 19, uh, from 1900. Uh, this one is from 1925. So he really wrote a lot, a lot, a lot of books uh, in his career uh, about uh, several different subjects. Uh, last but not least, uh, Camille Flammarion died uh, in June 3rd. Um, 1925, with 83 years old, uh, in his office, working office, and he has been struck by a heart attack, a little bit like Kardec, huh? so he died uh, standing, huh? uh, and he has been buried uh, three days later uh, in the park of uh, the Juvisis Rouge Observatory, alongside uh, his first wife, uh, Sylvie Petio, huh? who, as we have seen, died uh, six years before him. Okay. Um, voilà, so uh, that is, uh, in short, uh, his career. So let's see now uh, some opinions uh, he uh, uh, expressed. Uh, this one is about free will and fatality. Uh, so uh, he, he started writing, Laplace said in his philosophical essay on probabilities, that everything is held in the smallest events as well as in the largest, and that the freest will does not act without a determining motive. It is an illusion of our mind to think that it exercises freely by itself. The future, he adds, uh, Laplace, is determined by the causes which bring it about, and he who knew these causes would know the future as well as the past. So here you can see the clear uh, deterministic opinion uh, 
uh, everything that happens to us uh, is uh, according to this fatality. So we are like uh, some kind of programmed machines or animals or whatever. Huh? Uh, that is the opinion of uh, Laplace huh, about the free will. So Laplace was clearly denying the free will. Uh, and Camarion, Flammarion is answering, I admit, however, that I'm not absolutely of Laplace's uh, opinion. So he's uh, not absolutely not of his opinion. Huh? We feel within ourselves a certain faculty of thinking and acting, of extending our arm, for, for example, huh, in front of us or to the right or to the left or otherwise. The learned mathematician does not prove to us by any argument that this ultimate feeling is an illusion, as he asserts, and not a reality. So Camille Flammarion was really very strong about free will and uh, against uh, determinism uh, for, uh, as it was the case of uh, Laplace. I asked for my personal, if asked for my personal opinion, I would say that for me, human will exists and is an integral part of nature. It is a force which acts concurrently with all the others in the general movement of the universe. So strong believer of free will, as a lot of other scientists, as a lot of other philosophers like Bergson somehow, and uh, Men de Biran also at the beginning of the 19th century. Huh? And uh, as we have also some other uh, scientists today, uh, which are uh, uh, in favor of the free will, uh, one of the most famous uh, uh, scientists in the area of physics uh, is uh, Philippe Guillemot in France. And he's also strongly in favor of the free will and uh, strongly uh, uh, um, reacting against uh, this tendency to make uh, from the human being uh, a machine uh, which is completely determined uh, by uh, some conditions and uh, without any free will. Okay, so this is really what we do not observe. It's also uh, one of the fundamental principles of uh, the spiritist body of knowledge. Huh? We all have the free will and we are also responsible accordingly. Huh? And uh, uh, if we make good things, it's our decision. If we make bad things, it's our decision. And we will bear uh, the consequences, uh, which will be good uh, if we use it for good, and which will be less good if we use it for bad. Uh, okay. Continuing. Unlike Laplace and modern supporters of fatal determinism, I believe in a certain relative independence of human will and in responsibility. You see here showing we have the free will, but we are responsible for our choices. Huh? Certainly, our independence is not absolute. Huh? That's sure. We have a lot of influences about uh, society, education, uh, and so on. But we feel perfectly within ourselves that we can act more or less well or more or less badly, that we can be more or less selfish more or less useful or harmful. And this is fundamental because if you say we are a machine, okay, if tomorrow I go and kill someone, I will say it's the machine which is badly programmed. Uh, it's not my responsibility. You see immediately the consequences huh, of the determinism, huh, which is dramatic and also, uh, uh, how to say, wiping uh, every type uh, of, uh, of responsibility. Huh? And here is clearly uh, we can be more or less selfish, more or less useful or harmful, or we can uh, more act more or less well, more or less badly. This is exactly our choice. And it's not by chance that uh, we are acting uh, in this or in that way. Okay. The mind exists in itself. Feeling is part of the mind. Huh? The determinism comes mostly associated with the materialist paradigm, uh, which is uh, uh, denying the existence of the soul and it's uh, mo even more its survival. Uh. And uh, Flammarion, as, uh, as you know now uh, from the beginning, I'm, I'm telling that he was uh, a spirit following a spiritualist paradigm. So uh, uh, advocating that uh, in human being and everything which is living, there is uh, a soul, there is a spiritual principle. Okay, 
And this is then helping him uh, for coming uh, to these uh, conclusions. Okay. Uh, another uh, small, voila, what is the Flammarion's paradigm? Huh? Again, uh, coming from him directly. I did not lose sight of the circumstances which were offered to me to develop in journal articles, the thesis supported by my work, God in Nature. Uh, uh, God in Nature, the book uh, we talked about uh, already, uh, which has been written um, in, uh, in the 19th century. It's one of the first books he has written. Huh? Proving the existence of an organizing spirit manifested in the entire universe. So now science is slowly but surely and very slowly uh, even to these same evidences that if we make a probabilistic calculation uh, about uh, the creation of the universe, the Big Bang, this uh, very high order that must have existed at that, at that time in order to have uh, the universe as it is now, huh? And also some other questions like uh, how did the, li the life appear on Earth? Huh? Uh, the, the probabilistic calculation shows that uh, the, prob the probability is nil, huh? or it's 10 elevated at minus 100 or something like that, which is extremely low number and uh, showing that uh, uh, the apparition of life cannot come uh, by, by chance. Huh? It's not uh, uh, the probability being nil. There must have been uh, some organizing principles somewhere. Huh? Claude Bernard was also uh, convinced about this, and Camille Flammarion also very deeply. Huh? Uh, he, wore, he wrote this work, God in Nature, uh, very young, very early. And until the end of his life, he sustained, he was really uh, consistent and stable on this uh, strong op opinion. Huh? So, idem for the harmonies of sidereal world, huh, the plane of nature, construction of living beings, and the human intelligence. Huh. This is, must, must be from some uh, organizing spirit above all this, otherwise uh, it, it would not exist. With an independence constantly opposed to my interests, I moved away from the two extreme schools, generally accepted religion and materialist Re, uh, negation. Uh, so these are the two extremes, including fighting one against the other. Uh, religion fighting against science, uh, uh, as we have seen with Galileo Galilei uh, and, 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 and a lot of other cases. Uh, and the science also fighting against religion, like uh, anti-clericalism uh, and, and, and other uh, movements. So those are, uh, as shown by Camille Flammarion, two extremes. Uh, and he uh, moved away from these two extremes. So he was educated religious, as we have seen in Catholic religion, as we have seen uh, when he was young, uh, in the first uh, part. Uh, and then uh, when he so started to think and saw all the, these dogmas, which were absolutely uh, not understandable and even contradictory, uh, he, he moved away from this extreme. He came to science, uh, where it was pushing him to the other extreme, huh? but he was also, uh, he, he, st he stayed always to seek in rational philosophy, standing equidistance from these extremes, the glimmers of truth brought by the torch positive science. Huh? So this is really the, the, the attitude that Camille Flammarion followed. It's also the attitude that Alan Kardec followed. Huh? Uh, science is one extreme, religion is the other. What is the best of each one? Okay, the method from science and the, mor the moral laws from religions. Let's combine both in something new, which is spiritism. So you see, Camille Flammarion had a kind of a similar position, huh? uh, re re refusing to fall into one of these extremes. And this is really something very important in the world nowadays. Yeah? We can see in a lot of countries, a huge polarization of the opinion of the, of the people. We can see that uh, not only in Brazil, uh, where you have really uh, extreme right uh, against extreme left, but we have some similar situation even in the United States uh, and here in France as well. Uh, in, in, in Europe, you have also very hard opinions of the people 
uh, going always to the extremes, whilst uh, uh, we know that uh, the, 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 the right things are always in the middle. Uh, this attitude to taking both of the, on both extremes, there are good ideas and good principles. And what we really should do is take the best from uh, each side and combine them in something which is more neutral, which is less extremist. Uh, uh, and, and this is what would give the best results. And this is uh, the path that Camille Flammarion has followed all along his life. Evolution about, ev uh, sorry, opinion about evolution and plurali plurality of inhabited worlds. Uh, if the intellectual world and the physical world form an absolute unity, intellectual means spiritual, uh, uh, and all of the sidereal humanities, uh, sidereal humanities from a progressive series of thinking beings, so it's a plurality of inhabited world also at several different degrees, uh, more evolved planets, the Earth, which is one of the, let's say, two uh, of ten, uh, and there are even primitive world like the uh, Earth was uh, some uh, 10,000 years uh, ago. Huh? Uh, so he's clearly admitting also this. Huh? From the lower intelligence, barely emerging from the swadding clothes of matter, to the divine powers who can contemplate God in his glory and understand his most sublime works, everything is explained and everything is harmonized. Early humanity finds its place in the lower degrees of this vast hierarchy and the unity of the divine plan is established. So clearly, Flamil, Flamil, Camille Flammarion was uh, in favor of the plurality of inhabited worlds and also the evolution uh, uh, by uh, the, the spirits uh, evolving uh, from one world uh, to the other. Okay, So this is totally in line uh, with the spiritist body of knowledge. Uh, this is another uh, statistics I found uh, from another researchers. Huh? There is a, a non-profit organization of uh, the Friends of Camille Flammarion still existing today, and that I, I, I shall visit uh, also very soon. And uh, he is writing, he is indeed a man of the 19th century, although he lived 25 years in the 20th century, so one quarter of the century. Huh? Uh, he, he made a, a, a statistic about how many pages he wrote. Huh? So 29,000 pages. I showed you the encyclopedia, all these books and so on, the magazines, the reviews, the uh, annuary and so on. So uh, the, the guy uh, counted 29,000 pages. So this shows the extent huh, of the literature production by Camille Flammarion. Huh? But this guy is also saying his epistemological approach is not that of an academic, huh? yet he knew how to arouse the curiosity of a vast public about the sciences and the, of the universe, as evidenced by his numerous books published in several languages, including Russian and Chinese. So the translation of the book of Camille Flammarion are uh, indeed extremely uh, vast. Huh? There are a lot of languages, and not only Spanish, Portuguese, but also or English. Huh? You can see Russian and Chinese. So he was not really this scientific guy uh, focusing only on, sci on science. Huh? As we have seen, he was more for popularizing the science. Huh? Nevertheless, he made a lot of researches himself in his observatory in uh, Juvisy with a lot of collaborators, as we have seen. Even the growth of plants, uh, depending on the nature of light which is coming to them, uh, where it's uh, the red part or the uh, ultraviolet part or whatever. Uh, so he published a full report uh, on these uh, researches together with his pose. Uh. So he made researches, but uh, uh, maybe uh, of, uh, not only uh, he was also going into psychical research uh, that still today and including this guy who wrote this uh, questioned a lot uh, why did the guy enter in such uh, uh, other type of researches uh, because of uh, uh, the the fact that uh, science nowadays is still following unfortunately this materialist paradigm and is uh, uh, by far under evaluating the importance of the disruption that can be brought 
uh, in the search uh, of the of the nature of the universe huh? uh, simply by determining that uh, the matter does not in, only exist in the form tangible form we know huh? and that is uh, uh, studied by physics but exists also in some different uh, level of condensation uh, which is uh, not perceived directly by our uh, five uh, senses huh? and uh, which is uh, uh, today uh, not almost not studied at all but sci by science but it is starting and hopefully uh, this will be the next uh, scientific revolution huh? in the according to the definition of thomas kuhn huh? who has uh, written uh, this who was a specialist in this uh, epistemology huh? uh, what is science and how science is evolving huh? uh, giving the example of uh, the change uh, the, the revolu scientific revolution brought by albert einstein huh? uh, who uh, completed huh, the classical view uh, of the previous paradigm which was uh, from uh, newton uh, interestingly, uh, so let's hope that the next scientific revolution will be to uh, there is only matter, tangible matter to who there is much more than tangible matter. Huh? We know already today that uh, the scientists must admit huh, that 95% of the matter and even 97% of the energy is so called dark, so we cannot perceive it. So all our theories of physics is uh, covering only. 3% of the energy and 5% uh, of the matter that exists in the universe. So uh, this is clearly an anomaly that uh, will may be solved uh, only through a revolution of paradigm. And let's hope this revolution of paradigm will enter uh, in this uh, new concept uh, by uh, shifting to a spiritualist paradigm. And talking about Einstein, interestingly, I found also an article uh, that Camille Flammarion published in the journal uh, L'Astronomy, uh, volume 34, from 1920, uh, where uh, Camille Flammarion commented the Newtonian attraction uh, and Einstein's theory. So he was exactly commenting this change of paradigm from the classical mechanics to the uh, relativistic theory. Uh, and uh, just to remember at that time uh, this uh, even so the first publication from einstein about it is 1905 huh? uh, this einstein theory was still under heavy discussion and has been admitted and started to be taught uh, in the universities around the world only around the 1920s so it took something like 15 years to be recognized so interestingly, in this context is to see uh, what did Camille Flammarion think about this uh, 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 Einstein's theory. Uh, so Camille Flammarion is starting his article. Uh, yes, sorry, it's in Latin uh, at the beginning. Uh, uh, about uh, uh, like this. Uh, Many will pass and science will increase. Huh? So it's a translation of this uh, Latin sentence. Brought Francois Bacon. Huh? From century to century, science is transformed and it, all, it will always progress. Huh? And so this, he was clearly uh, also advocating the science will also progress. Remember that Laplace, that we talked about uh, the determinism, he was saying, at a given point in time, as a scientist movement, science is finished. We have discovered everything about science. There is nothing more to discover. So you see, Camille Flammarion was totally of the opposite uh, opinion. And uh, this new paradigm, uh, which was brought by Albert Einstein, showed clearly that Laplace was extremely wrong, huh? uh, mistaken to uh, pretend that science was finished. Huh? And Flammarion, on the other side, was writing exactly the opposite. Science will always progress. Huh? The reason is very simple. The essence of things is unknown to us. And the essence of things, clearly, huh, is writing. All our knowledge is only an interpretation of phenomena. Huh? The absolute remains secret to us. Our earthly senses only let us see 
appearances. So <clears throat> this is clearly, for instance, what is the, we know, we talked about Newton, huh? the sun and the earth uh, are attracting themselves. Uh, it's the law of gravity. Uh, we know exactly that this force is uh, a constant of gravity that mass one times mass two divided by uh, the distance between both at square. So we know exactly the law of this force, which enables to calculate uh, the trajectory of the earth uh, around the sun and so on. Uh, so we know perfectly how it was, but okay, but where is the rope? Where is the elastic binding both? Where is, or even the graviton particle? Uh, we don't know what it is, uh, the universal attraction. We know the law but we don't know the intrinsic nature, the absolute. And so Camille Flammarion is absolutely right in this. Even what we see as matter uh, here, uh, we know that it's composed of atoms and electrons combined into molecules, uh, uh, but the atom is a very small uh, um, uh, nucleo. Here I'm losing the, the, the no nucleus. Huh? and with some electrons rotating around him, but it's full of void. So how, how is matter having uh, this aspect? So it's, it's clearly, uh, we don't see the matter. We see the ref for, with our eyes, for instance. Uh, you, what you can see here from me, it's not me. There is some light coming here, which is uh, being reflected uh, by myself and which come back to the camera, which is sent then to your screen. And what you see, even when if you would be in front of me, you would only see the reflection of the light on myself. So you don't see myself, you know. We don't know the, uh, how to say, the essence of things as uh, Camille Flammarion is presenting it. Huh? So uh, he was, you see, until the end, huh, until 1920, staying very humble, huh? Uh, and totally admitting the evolution of science. And, and what Einstein brought was the evolution of science. So he made clear at the beginning of the article, he was not against that at the opposite. What is universal gravitation described by Newton? What is light? Uh, the classical theory currently taught admits that space is filled by the ether and that light is a wave movement in the ether comparable to the ripples that occur in a body of water into which a stone has been thrown, huh? a wave. Wavelengths are even measured huh, from the light. Newton brought, on the contrary, uh, that uh, thought, thought, sorry, on the contrary, that light represents an emission of particles launched from the sun and the stars. And the first question of his optics is, do bodies act on a light at a distance and deflect its rays? So you see, the question of Newton, which uh, by the, the, if you know the relativity theory of Einstein, was very uh, already in this, uh, in this way. Today, uh, the physics admits that it, uh, the light is both. Uh, it can be seen as a particle and as a wave. Uh, the particle is a photon. Uh, and it can be seen also as a wave. Uh, and this is, by the way, through also for the other particles like electron. Uh, is this a duality between wave and particle, uh, which has been established uh, more or less under, uh, in this uh, 1920s uh, by the quantum mechanics uh, specialist uh, amongst others. These are two opposing theories. Uh, you see, this is was his opinion at that time. In, in fact, it has been then uh, combined at the end. It can be one or the other, both of which can be supported. And the pressure of sunlight on comets, which produces cometary tails always facing away from the sun, and other observations support the Newtonian idea. However, today it turns out that a Swiss physicist already famous for his much discussed theory of relativity, Mr. Albert Einstein, presents a new theory which differs significantly from the two previous ones. First of all, for this philosophy, for this philosopher, space is not absolute, but relative. And what is more, linked to time, uh, this famous four-dimensional space-time in which we are living. Huh? Time becomes a fourth dimension of space, 
This conception seems new to most of the writers currently discussing this physical and metaphysical revolution. So he saw it already as a revolution of paradigm. I admit for my part that I don't understand it. So you see here Camille Flammarion admits I don't understand the relativity. So he has a humility to, to declare uh, I don't understand. I, I looked at it, I thought about it, uh, but uh, I don't understand even in some way I don't agree with it. Huh? So uh, if we would have left a little bit more time to Camille Flammarion or maybe if he would have been a little bit younger, maybe he had understood it as uh, most of the scientists or all the scientists and even uh, people in the school are understanding it today. Huh? But uh, he admitted, I don't understand it huh? with the current the state of knowledge at that time and the information he had uh, did not enable him to understand the the uh, fully the theory of relativity uh, brought by Einstein. It seems to me that despite Einstein's opinion, space and time do not hold together to this degree. Space can exist without time. It is absolute and without imaginable limits. Even if there were no celestial body, neither Earth, nor Sun, nor planets, nor any star, there would still be space, given that the void would even be a place where one could imagine that something was placed. While time is essentially rel relative, being a product of the movement of the stars. And by the way, huh, the, uh, the, the day is uh, divided, is one rotation of the Earth, huh? and the year is one rotation of the Earth uh, around the Sun. Huh? This is uh, how the time uh, has been defi defined uh, in our conceptions. This is probably what uh, uh, Camille Flammarion is mentioning here. Huh? If the Earth did not rotate, if no stars moved, huh, is, if there were no succession of phenomena, there would be no time. So this is an, a, a statement which is I would say a little bit audacious huh, and then which has somehow proven uh, to be false huh, because uh, space-time is now fully recognized uh, by Einstein. And that was exactly the point where he had difficulties in understanding at that moment. In absolute space, time does not exist. Space exists by itself. Time is created by movement. Huh? But Einstein goes further. He asserts that ultimately, if there is no distinction between natural and artificial gravitation, Newton's gravitational force is an illusion. In support, he presents an explanation of the effects of gravitation, which does not use any force. Einstein's reasoning is extremely complex, indeed. It begins by uniting our three-dimensional uh, space with time into a four-dimensional system, space-time. Then he shows that an acceleration defined in relation to the space-time is in every way identical to what we call gravitation, without it necessarily resulting in a manifest change in speed as a function of time, what we usually think of as an acceleration. Thus, in Einstein's theory, one can be stationary in the gravitational field on the Earth's surface and still be accelerated in four-dimensional space-time. Here again, we see through this statement uh, where he had the doubts and where he, he, he had difficulties to understand uh, the relativity uh, laws uh, brought by Einstein. But he continues, the learned Swiss professor plunges with pleasure into metaphysical obscurities and does not pride himself on being understandable. Of course, uh, uh, a lot of people had difficulty to understand uh, Einstein. It was only by uh, uh, Paul Langevin or some other who came some years later, that really uh, the understanding of this relativity theory started to be uh, more solid huh? and that it started also to be taught in the university. For him, space is curved, which is uh, still valid today, huh? and the celestial traveler who sets off in any direction and moves away indefinitely would return to the starting point. Uh, if the space is curved, you, you can uh, return to the starting point uh, in, in some way. Yeah? Uh, so you see how difficult it was, even by people uh, skilled like Camille Flammarion, to understand uh, that uh, scientific revolution brought by Albert Einstein. 
Uh, nevertheless, Flammarion is recognizing several things. Einstein's new law of gravitation deduced from these theories predicts the following three consequences. And that is really the famous, uh, the genius of Einstein of having given indication where his theory could be ve verified. Uh, light uh, first, light energy is heavy and a light ray grazing the edge of the sun must be deflected by a gravitational field, the angle of deviation being one uh, second uh, times 75. So the light of the stars are slightly deviated by the sun uh, because the sun has such a big mass that there is a curve uh, in the space time uh, around the sun. And this, uh, so let's, let, in the next slide, we will come to the, to the, to the result of the observation. Uh. Then the perihelion of Mercury is must move by 43 seconds per century. Uh, that was another uh, prevision uh, because Mercury is also so close to the sun that the uh, um, uh, um, classical uh, mechanics does not explain fully its trajectory. Uh, it's, uh, and uh, uh, that was one of the headache of Le Verrier who could not solve it. Uh, that has been solved only by Albert Einstein. And third, the line of the solar spectrum must be deviated towards the red in relation to the lines of the terrestrial spectra by a determined quantity. So this is so-called redshift uh, that is uh, so famous nowadays. So uh, then Flamin Flamin continues saying there were some uh, uh, big eclipses in 1919. By the way, uh, a lot of observations have been made in Rio de Janeiro because that is the place where the eclipse was uh, uh, in the most uh, adequate condition to be observed. And clearly, uh, the deviation of the, uh, of course, there was still some discussion about the interpretation of the measurements and so on, but clearly it has been seen, determined that the lights of the star, huh, which were around the sun at that moment, were deviated by the sun huh, and it could be observed because there was an eclipse, huh, the sun was hidden uh, behind the moon. Huh, and this enabled uh, these observations uh, to be done. And these observations really uh, were verifying the Einstein prevision. Okay. The second consequence uh, of the displacement of uh, Mercury's perihelion is also uh, was also uh, confirmed uh, uh, with the uh, relativity theory. And the third, that the, of the shift of the spectrum lines is not verified. So that was the statement of Flammarion at that time. But of course, uh, in the meantime, in the interval, uh, the redshift has been largely confirmed uh, by science. Uh, so uh, you can see here uh, what was the reaction of Camille Flammarion in front uh, of uh, this relativity law at the beginning. So I will accelerate a little bit uh, because the time is flying. Those who have studied psychic phenomena uh, uh, know that matter and energy are intimately associated. Uh, uh, this is all about relativity. Uh, that there is only one primordial substance, uh, the ether or the universal cosmic fluid of the spiritists, that the transmutation of bodies sought by alchemists is not an imaginary dream. Uh, also a quite audacious statement here. That matter passes through matter. Uh, and that space has no more has more than three dimensions. They also know that time is not what it commonly seems, and that the future can be seen as the past, uh, which is also one of the basics of the spiritist body of knowledge. They are therefore quite ready to admit the metamorphosis of current scientific theories but on conditions, if not underst of understanding them, at least of conceiving them. It is not essential to explain them, but they still need to not appear irrational. So he was really willing to understand, but unfortunately at that time when he wrote this article, he couldn't, uh, he was not yet able, he had not the enough, uh, uh, how to say, elements uh, enabling him to understand the theory. And that is what he wrote at the beginning. So he had the humility to say, I don't say it's false, it's wrong, but uh, I cannot understand it. And he finishes saying, 
Whatever the obscurity of Professor Einstein in his demonstration of the nature of light, this paradoxical contrast should not prevent us from admitting the high value of his various studies, which open new horizons to science, but which must not be accepted, which must not accept completely, but which we must not accept completely with our eyes closed. So this is exactly uh, his motto along his whole life. Huh? Uh, he applied exactly the same reasoning when he saw uh, the phenomenon. So he was convinced about the reality of the phenomenon, but for the explanations, he was also prudent to say, it's like this and it will never change. No, that's the opposite. So he was here again, not even not understanding, open to have uh, this uh, revolution happening. Its supporters assert that throughout the history of science, no genius equals his, uh, because the one who understood it already recognized really that uh, uh, what Einstein made was really uh, uh, outstanding. And uh, th this is why it is still today considered as the best example of scientific resol resolution. I would rather be inclined to things with Sir Oliver Lodge. So you see, uh, Lodge also had some doubts that his assertions are not absolute, but relative, and that they constitute only one further step in the ascent of the human thoughts toward the complete knowledge of reality. And that is how he's ending uh, his article, Camille Flammarion. And since we are already a little bit out of time, I will also finish my Flammarion uh, uh, presentation uh, on this statement, thanking you again a lot for your attention and your time and uh, eager to see the next presentation, uh, book by book, that will be done uh, every first Sundays of each month uh, by all uh, these uh, eminent uh, presenters uh, that have been invited uh, by the Spiritist Center of Peace, by British Union of Spiritist Society, by Kardec Radio. And again, thanks a lot uh, for this uh, grand uh, initiative. Peace and love for everyone. Thank you so much, Charles. Another wonderful presentation that we have to watch many times. There's so much information in that. This is fantastic. And, and two things that I want to highlight uh, before we uh, make the announcements and end the presentation. The first one is something very interesting you mentioned. That on, on, on the one hand, we have uh, religion and information that we have with religion, which is somehow concealed because of cultural problems uh, uh, knowledge that people didn't have, but the information is there. And it's basically information from our spiritual nature, not from the material world per se. And then we have science at the other end, who is there little by little digging in from our perception, our senses, what we perceive. And as uh, Flammarion mentioned, you know, this is a, a sort of a, a, a illusion that, you know, we, we learn from that. But I think the, the, the key aspect in that is that is to, to merge the scientific methodology procedure with the knowledge that is concealed and is there, the information within religions, at least the religions with a, a tradition and so on. And then we start to use the methodology to study what is spiritual, not only what is material. And I think Camille from Marion was fantastic in that because he gave his contribution to one ad but he used all the experience, all the knowledge that he acquired, especially the procedure to give his contribution, digging in the information that is there in religious books, in, in, and in philosophy, especially, as I said, you know, those with a great tradition. And the information is there. It's a question of you know, taking that information and, and um, making research. And as I normally say, university is a place where research should be universal. You should just bring a question, whatever, you know, uh, a question you have and use a methodology to start to study that. And slowly we see that happening, you know, as we advance on one end, we advance on the other as well. And the two, one day we'll meet halfway through it, as, as you mentioned before. And just as, as yeah, um, just a second um, comment. 
In 1919, Einstein, he came with a, a group of scientists. He, they went to the northeast of Brazil, to Sobral in uh, Ceará, uh, northeast mm -hmm. of, of the country. And there was a rival group from British scientists. They went to the north of Africa. The problem is the weather in the north of Africa wasn't good. And for, you know, uh, Einstein's um, luck, in Brazil, the weather was very nice. So they managed to observe the stars during the day and at night. Where, where, you know, whereas this other group, they had problems with the weather and partially covered and, and so on. And he came again, I think, 24, if I'm not mistaken, 1924, uh, to do more research. That was when actually he proved the curvature, you know, of, of the light going past, you know, a celestial body and then diverting it, uh, which actually proved that he was right in his idea of gravitation and the effect in, in the light. It was very, very interesting. Wonderful. It's a shame that we've run out of time. You know, we could go on for, for you know, hours. And uh, you mentioned so many interesting things. Just just was one last thing is uh, yeah. there are some books of Lamarion who has been rep reprinted recently. And this is one oh. of them. So it's very, very nice book, as you can see. Huh? Yeah. Uh, wow. It's a, a reprint of the uh, uh, popular astronomy. Huh? So from the... Uh, this has been published in 1980 for the 100 years of the first publication. And it's really, uh, uh, how to say, publishing uh, with all the images and uh, pictures and colored and so on. Very, very nice, fantastic books uh, that, that, that we can still find uh, uh, today. Uh, wow. in France, huh? So showing uh, how popular it was huh? uh, not, and, uh, and until today, for popular astronomy, he is uh, very, very well known. Huh? So Camille Flammarion is, and, and this is, I would say, his main mission huh? uh, to, to make this popularization of science. And since he was always uh, open also to um, uh, the psychic phenomenon, for us, he's a, a, yeah. a huge advocate huh, for uh, the spiritualist paradigm of science. And with this is absolutely yes. fundamental. It yes. is the fundamental change we need today. So Camille Flammarion was a, a front runner huh, together with Kardec uh, on this change of paradigm. And that is, I would say, the huge contribution he brought huh, uh, to, to, uh, to this uh, change of paradigm in the world. Huh? So, uh, and that is why he's considered uh, uh, wrongly uh, as a spiritist, because he was not truly yeah. spiritist, I have explained. He had some doubts. He recognized that the spiritist explanation was the best one, but he still was prudent, huh? saying, um, don't go too quick. Establish first uh, the... the uh, but also, as we have seen in the discourse, uh, recognizing that it was good that Kardec went until the last consequences. Otherwise, the spiritist body of knowledge would not be what it is. And if Kardec would have waited uh, the confirmation of science that we still today are waiting, uh, uh, more than 160 years after, we would not have uh, the spiritist body of knowledge as we have it today. Uh. Yeah. That's it. That's really wonderful. Thank you ever so much, Charles. You're it's good welcome. now that we have these uh, four you know, parts and people can basically study. Since we don't have the uh, uh, translation of the autobiography, you came with all this information, your research, which is so valuable, so much information that, that I did, didn't know, you know, and uh, then we can, you know, pick up something that you mentioned there and perhaps find more information to study that because indeed Camille from Marion gave a tremendous contribution. But then we mm -hmm. have now a series of lectures just starting the year, exactly. Camille from Marion's year. So, you know, people will come. I will just make the announcement who will be with us Please. at the beginning of uh, March, as the 3rd of March. But before I do so, I just want to thank Elsa Rossi, Ruben de los Santos from Uruguay, and we have Adilson Bonfioli, also our dear friend Solomon Waters. Hello to all of you. Thank you very much for uh, being here with us and making your comments and saying hello. So let me just make the announcement. So first, this series is organized by
um, peace, the Spiritist um, Center for Peace, and also sponsored by the British Union of Spiritist Society, BUS, uh, Kardec Radio, and also supported by the Irish Spiritist Federation. Next month, the 3rd of March, we have here with us our dear friend Vanessa, Dr. Vanessa Celoni from the Spiritist Society of Virginia, United States. She'll be talking to us about the mysterious psychic forces, an account of the author's investigations in psychical research, together with those of other European savants. So it's going to be a Sunday, 3rd of March, 7 p.m. London time, uh, Greenwich Meridian time. So I I hope that you know you all join us in one more uh, talk about um, our dear friend Camille from Ariel. And just to let you know that the Spiritual Center for Peace holds studies on Wednesdays, 12 noon, London time. We study on Wednesdays, um, Heaven and Hell, the book by Alan Kardec, and also the Gospel according to Spiritism. So everyone is welcome to join us. You have here, we use Zoom, um, and you have here the um, code and the passwords to join us. Everyone is welcome. We also have the study of the mediums book in English on Saturdays, coordinated by Guilherme Diaz, Charles Kempf and myself. It's 10.30 a.m. UK time, London time. And again, you have here the code and, and the password to join us. Most welcome to be with us. And finally, we want to thank Kardec Radio for uh, allowing us to use um, the StreamYard Studio to make possible all these talks and also these um, series and bring you this uh, information. So thank you very much to Kardec Radio. And that's it. Thank you very much, Charles. I hope to see you all on the 3rd of March, 7 p.m. London time. And for now, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very God much. Bless. God bless. Bye-bye.